Welcome to the Campground Catalyst Podcast, the show dedicated to fueling success in outdoor hospitality. Whether you're an outdoor adventurer, a campground owner, or looking to build your legacy in outdoor hospitality, you're right where you need to be. We're here to guide you through the fascinating world of campground management, unique real estate strategies, and the gratifying opportunities created by outdoor hospitality. Our mission is to inspire and equip you with the knowledge and insights you need to build a successful business and create a legacy worth leaving. The Campground Catalyst podcast is proudly sponsored by Beyonder Camp, your trusted outdoor hospitality experts. Subscribe now, join our active online community, and let's ignite our passions and potential together. Welcome to the Campground Catalyst podcast. I'm one of your co-hosts, Adam Lundy, bringing you today a segment from the Campfire Cashflow segment. This is, of course, a section for real estate professionals, those who are aspiring to buy their first campground um, or RV park or outdoor hospitality property. What is going on, Don, Justin, and Robert? What's up? Welcome back, everyone. How are you doing? Great day. Doing great, guys. All right, we're jumping in today with our very first listener-sourced question from the outside world. We've been publishing on the Campground Catalyst pages. So, of course, if you're not already following us on Facebook, Instagram, X, formerly Twitter, um, we're on all those. But we've got a link out right now that is taking listener questions. This is for a limited time only. In the near future here, we're going to be making this an, a Patreon-only opportunity to be able to get a question feature on the air. So now's your chance if you want to get an entire episode dedicated to your question and um, submit it on our form, which you can find on any of those channels. And then, of course, just get on our Patreon anyway, because that's going to be where the real conversations are happening with us behind the scenes. But we're bringing in a listener question today. Um, from Salvador Castaneda, who is asking us, how do you evaluate what a campground could be worth? Um, this is one that I love because this is what we do every single day, right? Yes, that's a good one. And it, go it goes all the way back to our roots on some of the broker opinions of value on these. So it's, it's uh, <laughs> funny. <laughs> oh my gosh. Yeah. Well, you know, just, just before we came on the air, you know, he was doing this for a completely different topic, but you ask a lot of brokers, how do you value campgrounds? And they're going to go, Mm -hmm. You know, <laughs> it, it's just like that. The, there are three main methods that you value real, real estate by. I could do this whole episode in 30 seconds, but of course, we're going to stretch this out a little bit longer than that and give some examples. But, you know, point being, there are three main values, you know, that you look at real estate for valuation. And, you know, really only one of those applies to commercial real estate. And that's going to be the capitalization approach. Simply, you know, taking a look at how much income you make and taking that pack by a market factor to come up with the value. So there you go. I hope that I hope that satisfied you, Salvador. All Episode's right. done. Show done. Yep. All right, guys. <laughs> Thanks for tuning in. Yes. <laughs> Unfortunately, it's not quite that simple. Uh, this is something that we at Beyonder do um, on a daily basis. You know, we run an acquisitions team. We're evaluating campgrounds that are sent to us all the time from people who are looking to sell their campgrounds um, or even looking, you know, to come to us for management. But, you know, one of the very first things we do is look at a book, look at their books rather. And, you know, when you go to a broker, if you're going to a reputable broker anyway, they should be asking for your books, not just, you know, how many sites you have. A uh, common mistake we get is somebody says, well, I have, you know, 150 sites. So how much are you paying per site? It's like, well, that's not the only thing we look at. Certainly, cost per site is something we factor in, but it really comes down to the performance of the business. And I'm going to go a couple layers deep on this today because I can talk about what you need to be doing now if you're planning to sell in the next three to five years or if you want to protect yourself and make sure that when you do go to sell your campground at any time in the future, whether it be 20 years from now or if you have an unexpected health incident and you have to sell immediately, that you're prepared to do it. So uh, I think it's it's something I take to heart. And, uh, you know, obviously in our commitment to creating legacies with everybody around us, um, it's one of those things we want to make sure that you're not losing out on all your hard work. So um, I, I guess let, let's get started first. Um, I, I kind of want to just pull the room on that. Um, you know, what, what are we seeing uh, in the past couple of years with, with cap rates? And we'll talk about what a cap rate is shortly. But, you know, what, what, what have you guys seen in, in our industry and maybe related industries and how it compares? Well, I, I'll start just from, from uh, a, lot of, a lot of the context I have that are in the multifamily or, or self-storage or other spaces. Um, they have seen a, a huge compression of, of cap rates in the, in the last few years. Uh, you know, some areas going as low as even like a, a 1% cap rate, and which is just insane to even think about. Uh, but, uh, but yeah, it, it's and it, it's across all industries, not just uh, multifamily, not just campgrounds, but it does affect us as well because it affects everybody across in the, uh, the, the commercial real estate uh, areas. 
people move from one to another because you know they they can't get great returns no longer in, in a certain area they'll transition to where is the next great deal is happening and there is that kind of transition happening in the campground space there are more buyers moving in to try to purchase campgrounds taking the knowledge that they have from other industries and trying to apply it here but it doesn't quite you know easily work out uh, you know just because you can underwrite a multifamily deal does not mean you can underwrite a, a campground deal because there are enough uh, differences that you can't just do a one for one uh, you know analysis of it yeah exactly justin yeah that, that's something we definitely learned in the beginning don is uh is how much extra time and due diligence is required to underwrite these and and it took us i don't know would you say 75 almost deals before we felt like we got somewhat of a handle on it um easily was, and yeah. we're still learning yeah of course <laughs> yeah uh but it also you know because it's in the hospitality space there's been some arguments about how to approach the the evaluation of these and and uh, one of those is the um is really like the the motel hotel side which is a a, a gross revenue multiplier and um you know especially in the hospitality space here where there's um a lot more expenses a lot of different expenses compared to a hotel that can be a little bit more streamlined but the um the noi is is really where you have to look the net operating income and not necessarily just the gross revenue because um, you can easily fill that gross revenue up with expenses so that's that's where it becomes dangerous if you're doing just a multiplier based on gross revenue um, I, I feel like there's a big opportunity to get stuck and in, and in, into a bad place there. I'm not going to name any names. Oh, go ahead, Robert. Sorry. Well, I think the discussion as well when you're evaluating the park is you brought up, well, what, what are you paying per site? Uh, yet some of these campgrounds that we're going into, the sites were built 20, 30 years ago for a particular size of RV. Over the last 15 years, the average size of an RV has gone up by 10 to 12 feet as to the amount of size people want the bigger they want the fifth wheels they want the travel trailers uh was just at an rv show this last weekend looking through units and they just keep adding more and more features to them you can't just turn around and say oh i'm paying this amount per site um, because not everybody's driving a small little 20 foot long travel trailer so there's going to be some improvements that need to be made and how much you can uh, effectively fill those sites as well. So that's a factor that uh, a lot of folks don't consider. They just look at the top line and say, oh, I remember this back in real estate. It's so many square feet. What's your price per square foot? Well, how are those square feet being used? You gave me flashbacks to BPOs and doing those during the foreclosure years, et cetera, of, of trying to come up with a value. You have to see it first. That's for sure. Yeah, and to your point, I mean, you know, not only have the rigs gotten bigger, but their power consumption's doubled in the past 20 years. So, uh, no doubt, those 30 amp parks aren't going to be the same as a 50 amp. So, um, well, well, very good, good points across the board there. Um, you know, to Justin's point, and and we're not going to name any names today, but there are people out there who purport themselves to be experts who are going to tell you there's a gross revenue multiple you can use for valuing a property. And I'll say. If you want to come up with a quick back of the napkin, you know, estimate of what something could be worth, it could be a good factor. You know, something, but it's not something you list the property and it's not something you actually plan on transacting a property on because no bank is ever going to write a loan on that. And you might not want to buy a business on that when you're doing your underwriting. You're going to want to know, you know, a great example for us is going to be we own a marina in our portfolio and we sell a lot of gas at that marina. Now, you know, if you, if you factored that gas as part of a gross revenue multiple like some of these guys are doing, boy, we should sell that property today, yes, you know, because we'd make a fortune on it. The trouble <laughs> is that fuel has about an 80% cost, you know, so really the profit that you make on all that is very, very minimal by comparison, which is why you have to get down to the bottom line. You know, you can make a lot of revenue and spend a lot of money getting there and you're not going to have a lot of profit. But you could also have a very optimized business that has a very high profit line. You know, so that's why we look at everything. Uh, that's why we actually need to see the profit and loss. And, and we go a couple layers deep. And, and, and I hope this helps Salvador out when, when he's looking at a campground. But um, it's we, we take a look through the P&L and, and we scrutinize every line. And we don't just accept, you know, their profit, you know, their, I'm sorry, their, their revenue, their expenses and their profit as is. You know, we go through and we look because, you know, the, what we have to remember is the campground owner who's selling has a vested interest in making that net operating income, that NOI bottom line, be the biggest number possible because that means more 
sale price for them. You know, so they're going to be looking for ways to pad their income if they can, maybe even doing it legally, but, you know, they're going to be looking to reduce expenses out of there that, you know, they're going to say, don't apply. Well, you know, hey, we paid for, you know, we paid for our, our own gas out of there. We paid for our health insurance out of there. We paid ourselves a, a salary. Well, okay, fine. You paid yourself a salary. Well, the person buying it's going to have to hire someone on a salary to run it. You know, they're not going to, or, or they're going to have to run it themselves and hopefully be able to pay themselves and not run it for free. So, you know, you have to really scrutinize those ad backs. You know, we do a whole course on this on how to actually get 10 layers deep into this. So we're not going to do that today because that, that in the course alone is about three hours. But, you know, it, it's really about scrutinizing to get to that bottom line. Um, you know, we, I, I, I failed in, in that I didn't explain what cap rates were a couple minutes ago when I asked about, hey, what we're seeing in cap rates and what that means to somebody. Don's mentioning cap rates compressing. That sounds like a bad thing, right? Cap, cap rates going down. He says as low as 1% in some self-storage in mobile home, which is insane. Um, but that said, you know, the, the lower the cap rate, the better for the seller. It, it, it means there's more market demand. It's, it's the factor of demand. And the lower that number gets, of course, the higher the price you're going to pay for that property. Um, you know, we've seen a lot of compression in our space already in the past few years. You know, when when Justin and I got into this, gosh, I mean, we were looking at 11 to 13 cap. I was going to say 12 to 14, and we've been chasing it down ever since. Yeah, it's compressed a lot since then. I mean, but we've also seen some adjustment. You know, within the first year we got into this, we watched that, yeah, 12 to 14, whatever you want to call it, compressed down to about 8%. And then it kind of rippled back up to about 10% in the past year here as, as loan rates have gone up and demand has, you know, taken a little bit of a plateau. So... Um, you know, those those rates do adjust and there's a lot of consideration to give for the value. So the simple formula, you know, which we'll get, you know, I just want to get it out now so we can get help Salvador out. And of course, anybody else who's getting into this is to take that net operating income, that final number on the P&L, once you've adjusted it for anything that needs to be adjusted and you divide it by the cap rate, simple as that. Divide it by, you know, if you have $100,000 NOI and the cap rate's 10%, $100,000 divided by 10% gives you a million dollars. So very simple. What do you guys think? Yeah. Well, I'll throw a little wrench in that. Just, just ask for for those who may not know and want to know, where do you get the cap rate from? How do you determine what the cap rate is to know what you're even dividing by? I've got a match gate ball that tells me that. <laughs> Very good. Yeah, that's probably the best way to go. Yeah, yeah. No, and that's a great question. So, you know, what what we typically look at is we want to find like properties that have sold recently um, that we can use for comparison and look at the cap rates they sold at. That's going to give us an idea. Um, and kind of to Robert's point, there are a lot of factors about the condition and age that can weigh in on that. You know, so typically if we're looking at a property that is as up to date and modern and, you know, well maintained as it possibly can be and the businesses run really well, you know, we're typically looking at something that's going to have a more compressed cap rate. It's a very optimized business. Whereas you have something that is tired, run down, you know, is going to need a lot of work, is really falling behind. There might be a lot of opportunity in that. We like that opportunity because it gives you some room and there's going to be less demand for that property. So therefore that cap rate is going to be a little bit higher, you know. So just in our space, if you look at from the very high end, super mega luxury RV resort that might be at about a, you know, six to seven percent cap rate on a really, really good day, um, all the way up to right now, we're looking, you know, 10, 11 percent in some cases on some of the you know, campgrounds that hit that need more work. And some of the some of the details on that you have, uh, we had one that we were evaluating recently. I think they had six family members that were on the payroll somehow, some way, whether it was above the line or below the line or part of the line as to what they were paying them out. So that was one aspect of it. Uh, another park where all of the staff was 100% work camper, 1099, no workman's comp paid. Um, it was just strictly volunteer labor that was in there. Uh, once you actually consider what it takes to run that park a, a correct way, um, with the right taxes being paid, the right insurance being paid for your employees, um, suddenly that uh, NOI at the bottom line goes away. Um, there wasn't as much uh, juice in the game for that particular property. And I don't care what rate you put on it, um, it's going to calculate time zero uh, once you start actually putting the real cost in there. Yeah, amen to that. You know, and, and there's so many factors that go into this, like I said, and, and we, we've got a whole course on this, you know, so I'm not going to belabor it too bad right now, but um, you really have to look at their operation and consider what it's going to look like for you. You're going to have to update the numbers for you because they built this business for them and they may be representing something that serves them. Uh, but let's say you've got a mom and pop that are working at seven days a week, 12 hour days, you know, if that is not your goal, if your goal is not to buy a job where you're working twice as much as you're working now, you need to have appropriate, you know, 
re, uh, income in there to cover paying the staff that you need. Otherwise, you're going to be basically replacing mom and pop. You know, so if they've got a very low payroll budget, you might want to plan on padding that and, you know, really considering, you know, what it's going to cost to bring somebody in to run the day to day for you. You know, likewise, um, one of the most um, underrepresented things we see is insurance nowadays. And that's uh, that that's a big consideration for anybody. You know, in our particular model, we're accountable to our investors and we have to make sure we're protecting their interests. So we over insure by some people's standards. But, you know, quite frankly, I think we're putting ourselves in just a really good position. But we pay a lot of money for insurance. You know, and it's not uncommon for us to go and, and see people spending as much as I spend on my homeowner's insurance to insure their campground and business. And, you know, I have to wonder how, you know, miserably uninsured they are. But um, that's where, you know, we're going to have a whole other section on insurance and, you know, get, making sure that you're properly covered on these things because, God, there are so many risk centers in these properties. Yeah, yeah you're naming some pretty big uh, line items there for, for expenses and uh, taxes. In order. <laughs> <laughs> taxes is another one, right? When you when you purchase a property, if it hasn't been sold in 30, 50, whatever years, you know, it's going to get reevaluated typically by the county. <clears throat> and then you're going to be responsible for a much larger tax bill. So making sure that you're thinking about that. Uh, one of the earlier things that we learned was labor, right? And um, we all saw this issue kind of come up during COVID, but labor expenses went through the roof and it's hard to find good people, hard to hard to pay the right amount. And so uh, some of our initial underwrites included a labor amount that was um, much, much less than what we're paying right now. Um, and so that's another big, big ticket item that, you know, yes, you're talking about adding that, especially if the owners are paying themselves, but also, um, you know, get kind of to the work camper where it's free, but man, you know, you got to be careful because it'll get eaten up real quick. Um, and then, and then we, um, kind of on the CapEx side, the capital expenditure side. So if you see, if you see a property that's got a lot of deferred maintenance, which is, which is kind of a big problem, you don't want the park to fail. You don't want people to, um, just to simply not be able to plug in, for example. So some of the big items that need to happen to get the park operational are important. And we add those items basically to what the purchase price would be considered. So if it's a, a purchase price of a million bucks, it's gonna take 100,000 to get it into quote unquote operational order, then uh, we'll, we'll consider the cap rate based on a 1.1 measure, not the 1 million. So keeping in mind those, um, initial expenses not to say you all the upgrades should go into that but just simply the deferred big deferred maintenance items can be reevaluated into that yeah very good point well actually i want to touch on the capex too because that's something that we see all the time which is you know it, when you start evaluating these campgrounds in salvador and anybody else who has this question you know the, the best experience you're going to get is just looking at multiple campgrounds you know the, don't don't expect your first one's going to be the one it may be but you need to look at a bunch to get an idea what these things look like and what you're going to start seeing is trends like i said the owner has a vested interest in adding back as many expenses as they can to raise that NOI. And, you know, one of the ways they're going to do it is they're going to start taking things like the repairs and maintenance line and saying, oh, well, you know what, those were capital improvements, you know, and you need to actually ask them for, for detail on that. Like, I want to see invoices for this stuff, for, for what you're claiming you did as capital improvements, because a capital improvement is something that extends the serviceable life of the property. You know, it's something that you're actually, you're either installing something new or you're replacing a significant system that is going to extend the life. A repair is not that. You know, so if they, for example, have, let's say, oh, I don't know, a swimming pool with a leaky liner, uh, you know, and, and they did a repair job on that liner, that's not a capital improvement. If they replace the liner, that is, you know, so really got to scrutinize that stuff because, again, just remember, it, they, they might not have ill intentions, but their goal at the end of the day is to make as much money selling that property as they can, and they're going to be adding back as much as possible. Lawn Another mowers, tractors, cleaning supplies, office supplies, pens, pencils, um, and systems, systems that are in place. Uh, having, how are they taking their reservations? Um, do the books, uh, what they're claiming as reservations, do their books match deposits? Uh oh, I just hit the third rail there, didn't I? Is that the, uh, <laughs> the uh, profit and loss statement? Um, is indicating one thing, but the credit card statements and the cash statements in the bank don't match. Yep. Well, and that's that's actually I was a place I was planning on going already anyway, so let's dive into it. 
Um, you know, the PNL is great and all. The thing is, a PNL is a document created by a person that can be manipulated. You know, we already talked about the people adding stuff back. Um, you know, when we're evaluating a property, you know, it's it's kind of a trust but verify thing. You might have a great relationship with mom and pop, and I've heard of a lot of people buy campgrounds on a handshake and not a lot of due diligence. And and quite frankly, I hope it works out for the best for those folks. But um, you know, we we do a, a little bit of double checking on that. You know, and, and the easiest way to do it is to compare documents that have those same numbers. So tax return is a great start. You know, line the the P and L up next to the tax return. Now understand they're not going to be 100% spot on because a good CPA is going to find things in there that you can remove, and you know you're going to see some minor adjustments to it, but it shouldn't be substantial. If it's more than like a 10 to 20% difference, you know that that's probably something that uh, you need to investigate a little bit further. And then the second is bank statements. Um, you know, it's one of the things we request, and we've got a long list of due diligence documents we actually put in our course, which we'll share in the show notes today, just in case anybody does want to go take the course. Uh, but we have a due diligence list, and one of those things is 18 months of bank statements. And we'll go through for, you know, every one of those months, and we'll add up all the deposits to make sure it matches what they're showing as income, you know, because all that money should be going to the bank. And, you know, if they're siphoning cash out the side of the business, which does happen in this business quite often, um, we need to have some way to account for it to prove that that income truly exists somewhere banks and credit card statements because the credit cards usually go through the third party processor it goes to a separate account there might be a batch that's sent over and then what are the credit card fees um we're seeing it as you go to the gas station you see a cash price and you see a credit card price um when you go to the stores that's what you're seeing uh so is that uh, credit card fee also being taken into consideration because that's a that's a three or four percent haircut that you're taking and if you see me on video i don't need any more haircuts so. <laughs> uh, if you turn around you still got a little bit on the back <laughs> uh, not, really much, yeah. not much well, so, so something else to consider also is just the you know the the, the tax the tax do documents right what they actually are telling the government they made on their property because they might not unfortunately match what they show on their PLs either uh, so it's good to, to verify that and say, okay, well, if, if you're if you're making, you know, a, a million dollars a year, why is your tax statement showing you're making half that, you know, and kind of reconcile that difference and figure out what's going on. And sales tax, not just the year end uh, return, <laughs> but the sales tax that's actually being reported yeah. and actually being paid so that you don't have a surprise a year later as to, well, guess what? All of those sodas you sold, there was never taxes uh, collected on them or... Uh, when you're talking about hospitality, hospitality has different tax rates, uh, et cetera, than just a retail purchase. And you guys saw me laughing there because we have seen P&Ls that included taxes as an income amount. So be careful. You got to watch everything on these things. Well, if it's the Internal Revenue Service, maybe. But. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, okay, I'm, I'm going to throw this one out there because th this is one we discuss often around here. But uh, so you get a broker, it brings you a deal. You know, you're talking to some, you know, campground broker who brings you an RV park and he says, hey, it's, it's worth this much at this cap rate. And here's why. And they hand you a pro forma. You know, they're saying this is what we think this property can make. Um, this is going to be something you run across often. What, 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 I mean, what, what's the consideration there? Well, my, my opinion for, it goes for anything. I, I would never base something on what it could be worth. Uh, it's like, what's it doing now? What's it has it? What's it been doing the last you know three years or whatever? Uh, if there's an upward trend, you can maybe say, okay, it's potentially could get there, but there's no guarantees it's going to get there. So I, you know, I'd still base it on current and past uh, performance, not future. Kind of same with anything. You know, you look at uh, you know, you, you want to invest in stocks, or they they, say, they never say, you know, your, your returns are guaranteed. It, it's more of, you know, future performance is no, uh, or past performance is no guarantee of future performance, something like that. Um, so, so you want to make sure you're you're looking at current and past, not hypothetically speaking. Yeah, this is going to be awesome, you know, a, a year from now. But that's maybe maybe under their current management, the way they've been doing things, you may not run the same way. You may not get those kind of same returns. Uh, you know, all the campers there might love that person. As soon as they leave, they're gone too. So uh, there's no uh, there's no guarantees there. So I definitely would never base it on future performance only. But that's a that's a big thing in the apartment space, right, Don? I mean, that's things we get sold all day long from these brokers. You know, what's the market rent, whatever. <clears throat> but what, what I get, I'm I'm a little um, I don't know. It kind of gets me worked up a little bit when I hear this kind of stuff because I've seen so many deals come across my table for all the, all the years. And, and, um, 
And I just refuse to have someone ask me to do the work to make the property more valuable so that, I, you know, why would I pay for that? Like, if I'm going to do the work, I want to get paid for that. I'm not going to pay you for the opportunity for me to do the work. So that's the way I look Great at point. it. Yeah. yeah, I like that. Yep. Um, any well, purchase. Well, Go ahead, Robert. Well, you, you take a look at it. You, okay, let's say the park has 100 sites. What is their mix of sites? And I know we'll talk about this in another episode, but are they overnight sites? Are they seasonal sites? So let's say they claim that they have seasonals that are in there, 80% that say seasonals. And then you go and look on Google Maps and maybe you just happen to catch them the one day that they only had 30% of their park filled because you can look at the sites and see how many of them actually have an RV in them. Um, but taking a look at those 100 sites, um, are they realistic in what they're projecting as well? You're not going to have every site filled every night of the year. I don't care if you're even in Florida. Uh, there's people that are going to get out of those sites at some part of the year, and it's not going to be 100% occupancy. Uh, some sites are more uh, weekends than others. Uh, so you have to take those factors into play as well. Does their math that they have equal to a realistic occupancy rate. And unlike a hotel, I can't go by and see which lights are on or which lights are off. Maybe I do have to visit the park on a Thursday or a Wednesday as part of my due diligence, not just in the peak part of the season or the peak part of the weekend. Yeah, I usually end up visiting parks we're looking to buy in the middle of the week. And uh, yeah, it's amazing to see, you know, how dead some of them might be, despite them talking about how busy they are. Uh, but you make you make a point, Robert, which is, of course, you know, we do have a lot of things we can use to verify. Unfortunately, you know, if they're using a park management system, a good online, you know, a good web based reservation platform, uh, something we can actually go pull the reports and, and compare occupancy, compare rates, you know, see see how things look. Um, you know, comparing utility bills, if you, you'll start to get an idea as you look at these uh, often enough, you know, how much electricity on average a certain number of sites uses in a given time in a given part of the country. So you can get some idea if they're actually really, you know, doing what they claim they're doing, you know, and then it goes back to exactly what Justin said, which is that if you're, if you're buying on a pro forma, you're basically working to, you know, pay them for potential that hasn't yet been realized. I'd say even well, for to keep it as simpler as a simple real estate thing, uh, if you were yourself as a homeowner going to go buy a, a new home, are you going to buy your your house today based on the value today, or you say, well, it's, the broker will tell you it's going to be worth, you know, ten times more in, in a year, so pay that ten times more price now. It's like, no thanks, I'll <laughs> I'll pay what it's worth today, not what this future value is. Yeah, and how do the brokers respond when you say that, right? <laughs> <I> mean, <laughs> yeah. They're not happy when you bring up that kind of an attitude. Don, come on. <laughs> but, uh, you know, another another area that I wanted to address, uh, you know, you talked a little bit about banks. I don't want to go into the whole bank and underwriting uh, for them. And, and um, But one of the things, one of the big areas they're going to come back to you with is the DSCR, the debt service coverage ratio. And, um, and that is a requirement for banks to maintain a certain ratio of income over the mortgage. So that uh, that amount um, can sometimes be as low as 1.2% or 1.2x multiplier. And um, some areas in the country uh, will be a little bit different. 1.2 is very aggressive. That means the bank just wants it. Like if they're telling you that's all, all they need to get the loan done, that they're just, yes, we want it, we'll take it, whatever it takes almost, because you're gonna see that in most instances. Uh, but in our opinion, uh, that is extremely risky. The lower the number, the more risky it is. If it's negative, then you're paying out of pocket and not making anything. So so we're looking at numbers towards 1.7, and that buffers the risk factor with the bank and what you're gonna have to pay them each month. So uh, make that a consideration as well. And we can help with that, uh, it's in the course. And, um, and we have the spreadsheets that that help, you know, outlay that too, so. I'm gonna add one quick correction there. Um, it's actually not when the DSCR is negative, but it's when it's below one. Below one, I'm sorry, yeah. yes, below so one. So the, the idea is, we talked about that NOI before, and, and this is actually good, because this is something I want to get to anyhow, but which, you know, you're taking your, your your revenue minus your expenses to get your NOI, and just because it fits into a certain, you know, market cap rate at the time does not necessarily mean this thing will be sustainable, because that does not factor your debt service in. So you got to factor in the loan that you're gonna be taking next, so you need to have, you know, some idea of what your debt terms are going to look like as far as interest rate and the amortization period so you can get an idea of what you're going to be paying in debt you might be surprised to find out that the property can't even serve as its own debt 
that's something we see day in and day out. And it's we step over a lot of properties that we can't buy for this very reason. So that's something you absolutely have to know up front. And yeah, like Justin said, if it's so to, to give you an idea of what that means, the, the debt service coverage ratio is let's say you had a property that the NOI was $100,000 a year and your debt service was $100,000 a year, you're going to be spending every penny of that profit on the loan. You have zero, that's a DSCR of one. Right. And like Justin mentioned, a DSCR of, you know, 0.5 would then be your debt service is 200,000, but you only make 100,000. So you got to come out of pocket for that. Um, so, uh, yeah, obviously, the, the higher that number is, of course, more beneficial for you because it's more money in your pocket. You know, so we should be we should targeting, you know, 1.5 and higher. Then you become a weatherman because you're praying that it doesn't storm. You're praying that it doesn't snow. If you're praying that there isn't a tornado that comes through or a windstorm and knocking down trees, etc. cetera, uh, because then your park shut down for a period of time and you're not able to service that debt, let alone make any income. And if you're on the insurance policy that transferred over from your auto insurance company to cover your campground, uh, then <laughs> that might be more than just a prayer at that point. <laughs> Well, well, That's very good, guys. Just didn't save you. <laughs> no, it didn't. Might might have cost you 150 percent or more. Uh, well, well, guys, great conversation today. Of course, you know, like we said, this is not meant to be an all-encompassing course on how to underwrite a campground. If you are looking for that, our RV destination mastery course will be linked up in the show notes, or you can find it at happycamperuniversity.com, uh, where that can be uh, purchased on there. There's actually a free lesson on there where we talk about how to find campgrounds. So uh, check that out. Uh, appreciate the conversation with you guys today. Thanks for joining us. Uh, this has been another episode of the Campground Catalyst podcast. All right, guys. Have a good one. Take care. Thank you for joining us on this episode of the Campground Catalyst podcast, where we take you behind the scenes in the fun and gratifying world of outdoor hospitality. We hope you are inspired by today's show and better equipped to take the next steps in your journey. Remember, you can continue the conversation and connect with fellow enthusiasts by visiting our website and joining the Campground Catalyst community on Patreon at campgroundcatalyst.com. There, Patreon members get exclusive access to special listener perks, they get their opportunity to engage with the hosts, and they get their questions answered on one of our future upcoming shows. The Campground Catalyst podcast is proudly sponsored by Beyonder Camp, your trusted partner in fueling your success in outdoor hospitality. Until next time, keep both your campfires and your passions burning.